This is Plate Mark. My name is Ann Schaefer and I am your host. This is series three of Plate Mark in which I'm interviewing the fabulous people who occupy various roles in the print ecosystem. And today's guest is Craig Zamiello, who is a printer and has been a printer for many years uh, worked for ULAE for 25 years and now is a printer at Two Palms and is working on a project with R. Crumb at the moment. He's got amazing stories for us, so I think you'll enjoy it. All right, let's see. Housekeeping. I identify as a cis head white woman and I use the pronouns she, her. I record plate mark in Baltimore, Maryland, the land of the Piscataway Conway people. Images are over on the show notes. You all know this at platemarkpodcast.com. Over there also is a support and donate button. I am the only one producing all of this stuff and I do it all. And if you value the content that you hear at Platemark, your support would be most appreciated. So when you hit the support and donate button, you can choose to become a monthly subscriber or you can do a one-time donation. Your help would be seriously appreciated. I thank you ahead of time. Okay. Buckle up. Let's get rolling. Craig, good morning. It is great to see you. Thank you for coming on Plate Mark today. Thank you for inviting well, me. Of course. We were just talking before we started uh, recording, and I said, I feel like I've known you, but have never met you, and I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> because you're a rock I, star. Well, here we go. You know, <laughs> like, well, maybe I have become a rock star. And, uh, you know, that was my intention when... Uh, being an undergrad in college. Why don't you start by introducing yourself for everybody, and then we can hear, hear about your rock star ambitions. Okay, all right. Well, Craig Zamiello, born and raised in New York, have been living on Long Island for uh, the good part of my life. Big ties to New York City, from my relatives and what have you in Queens and Manhattan and stuff like that. So I grew up exposed to um, culture of New York, how did one get into printmaking? Well, um, the family was artistic. Uh, you know, everybody drew and paint as I grew up in my family, so I was exposed to that. And that naturally led to that in uh, my years in uh, high school. Uh, a new high school was built in my town, and they had a very big budget. And one of the high school teachers was a printmaker. So 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, I was in a complete functioning print studio in high school. That's incredible. Etching, photography, self-screen. Yeah, and it's always a great indoctrination, you know, the fact that I could um, work on a drawing in etching and have more than one at the end of the day, plus all of the uh, accoutrements that come from working with printmaking with metal and what have you. Um, so that led to me developing a love for all things print and kind of bounced around in, uh, in undergrad in college, Southampton College on Long Island, uh, Farmingdale University. Wound up at some point at State University at Stony Brook where again, meeting a very influential printmaking teacher, Dan Weldon, who is a pretty good name in our ecosystem of printmaking. When I graduated undergrad, he uh, literally the day after, he called me up and said, there's a studio on Long Island that needs someone to organize prints and make packages and, you know, for shipping and stuff. And I said, Dan, please, I just graduated. I want to relax, you know. I've, I've got music to make and what have you. He said, no, no, you have to go and get an interview. No, Dan, no, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> if I have to drive you there, you're going. Now, I would never heard of the place. And so I called him up, made an appointment. A couple of days later, I drove there. It happened to be 15 minutes from where I lived, which was pretty, you know, pretty sweet for a commute. I walk in and I immediately noticed, there's a Robert Rauschenberg. Those are Jasper Johns. <laughs> oh my God, that's a Jim Rosenquist. And I almost fled immediately, <laughs> just ran out the door. But was quickly stopped by Tanya Grossman, who said, Oh, what a pleasure to meet you. Um, please sit down and let's talk this out. And I literally tried to not get the job. 
She was saying things like, we need you to drive to the city once or twice a week. And, uh, oh, I don't know anything about the city. Oh, that's fine. When everybody gets here, they don't know anything. You'll learn, you know. And it was that type of, uh, of an indoctrination. So I agreed. And after the first day, I was like, oh, my God, I don't want to leave this place. So, and, of course, that was Universal Limited Art Editions. And I was with Universal Limited Art Editions in various roles for 25 years, so, um, from 1978-ish up to 2002. Wow. So, yeah. And, you know, fresh out of school, four months into working there, my last art history term paper was on an artist, Robert Rauschenberg. And he's in the studio working and, you know, just, <laughs> yeah, so I was, you know, yeah. that type of thing. And that night for him to say, like, what are you doing up here in the litho studio? You're an etcher. You know, get down with the etching people. And he started to laugh and I was like, oh, wow. You know. Wait, I'm, Rauschenberg said that to you? Person. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. You know, in his jovial manner. I mean, Robert Rauschenberg was... If I had to describe him, he's bigger than life. He he was joy. You know, he he lit up anywhere that that he was. In my tenure at Universal Limited Art Editions, he was the main artist that I worked with and produced work for. Um, that I don't want to use the word collaborate too much. I think it's it's uh, wait. Overused term. Wait, hold on. He's the artist I colluded with. <laughs> <you know? laughs> I conspired with Bob Rauschenberg. I uh, teased Bob Rauschenberg into making uh, <laughs> the next new group of sweets. You know, what's going to be next? From photo engraving to photogravure to four-color photogravure to painting on, you know, prepared plexiglass plates with you know, photo emotion on it. Uh, my love is obsolete 19th century photo mechanical reproduction techniques. That's my, you know, one of my things. So, and uh, he was all for that. You're you're so. an enigma wrapped in a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> like you started in all of the processes and then suddenly you're doing like Woodbury types. Like what the heck? Well, that was the Holy Grail, Woodbury types. Yeah. And... In 2002, it was time for a change for myself. And uh, some of the younger artists had suggested another studio that I knew about through many of the artists working at Universal Limited Art Editions, such as Terry Winters and Carol Dunham and Cecily Brown, called Two Palms, at the time Two Palms Press in New York. And they had wanted to create a um, etching studio because at the time they were mainly um, relief printing and monotypes. So I got in touch with them, uh, David Lazary and his wife, Evie Lazary, Evelyn. And we made an appointment and walked in and I was like, this is so different, this dynamic of this studio, but yet familiar because a lot of the artists mm. visiting and working, we were, you know, together for years. So I made the jump uh, around 2002 into Two Palms. And the first thing I saw when I walked into the studio was a massive hydraulic press, a horizontal hydraulic press. And the first thing that popped into my mind was, oh, my God, we can make Woodbury toys. What? <laughs> <laughs> And I, you know, I mentioned it to David and he was, okay, what is that? You know, so, and I said, well, that is the, that is as high as you can go in, in photo mechanical reproduction. It's an incredible thing. And so from 2002 up until, oh God, I don't know what year we started, 2006 or seven, myself and another printer from Universal Living Art Edition, Douglas Voley had moved over also uh, to Two Palms. And he was experimenting, you know, at home in his own lab, 
trying to figure out the process of Woodbury type. There's a front end and a back end of it. And uh, we were kind of getting the back end with the hydraulic press, pressing stuff into lead to make molds. But the front end was giving us a lot of trouble. David actually bought the, uh, you know, the uh, copyrights or the patents to Woodbury types from the Library of Congress. What? We thought, well, we thought, okay, you know, because there's really nothing written about it in, in the books. You can look up photo reviewer and have hundreds of, you know, texts that have been written from the 19th century up until the present day. Including a book by you. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, Woodbury types, no. And we found one. I mean, I, just stop me if this gets to be too convoluted or long. <laughs> well, I am going to make we, you stop and go back and describe yeah, there you go. after you're done with your story. Go ahead. We we uh, we found a book that had come out. I'm not sure of the published date, but it was by Barrett Oliver. And it was a history of the Woodbury type. And we were like, oh, my God, let's get this. So we get it. And on the first page, it says, I've made Woodbury types. And then on the second sentence, I'm not going to tell you how to make a Woodbury <laughs> type. Uh, we romanced him. We we talked to him. And we finally decided on uh, a group effort. And we brought him out to New York because he lived in L.A. That, that started it for Two Palms, um, you know, the master work of Barrett Oliver. And, of course, the best artist to utilize Woodbury types would be Chuck Close and his portraits. From there, it went to Matthew Barney making Woodbury types. What is it about Woodbury types that makes them so be much better than, I mean, photogravures seem to me to be the epitome of getting lush, beautiful, reproductive, continuous tone imagery into, you know what I mean? Right. right. Yeah. Well, you'd need a, almost an electron microscope to see the breakup pattern of a Woodbury type because it's a, it's a casting of gelatin. So you have a lead relief plate. You pour pigmented gelatin, a little puddle of it that's heated up, onto that relief plate, put a piece of paper on top of it, put it under minor pressure for a few minutes until the hot gelatin cools down and gels, and you peel it off, and you have basically a, a photograph that was made mechanically. But you look through a loop, it's got the same grain as a black and white gelatin print. Woodbury types were the first mechanical way to reproduce a photograph without going through the chemical process and exposure and what have you, if you wanted to make more than one. Okay. The problem was why it fell out of favor was at the time in the late 19th century, I mean, you basically needed a locomotive engine in your factory to power a tiny hydraulic press and... They had to be cut out because the excess gelatin squirts out the sides, which we love, you know. <laughs> we leave that. But they had to be cut out. Photogravure comes along, and all of a sudden, you can make plates that can be printed in the book with type. So there's a lot of things, you know, why it fell out of favor. I'm sure but, you can see on my face a look of, like, wait a minute. <laughs> like, so can you, I, can you go back yeah, to the beginning on Woodbury? That, any point, and this, <laughs> just, if the arcane starts to get so deep, just, you know, say, hey, hey, wait, wait a minute. Well, you know? so, I mean, I had Lothar on to talk about photogravure a couple of episodes ago, and, you know, he described the whole process in his fabulously animated way, and I still was like, what? <laughs> So I won't make you do that, but I will please go back to the beginning of the Woodbury type situation and how it works. Well, in the, in back in the day, it was a wet plate collodion, you know, negative. Okay. And then that's exposed to what we call a relief film, uh, which is very thick gelatin um, that's dichromated with a salt. It's then exposed with that negative plate. So we, what we want is a positive. Uh, that's washed for three days in, you know, running water at 100 degrees or so uh, to clear it. And what you wind up with is an actual film that when it's wet or even dry, you see a relief to it. So the shadows are thick and the highlights are super thin, like a piece of saran wrap. These things, they're, they're made on collodion. They're... they're um, you know, just peeling them off the 
glass, if the relative humidity is uh, off by a few points, they'll shatter or they'll, you know, they won't come off the glass if it's too high. Uh, there's so many things that made this process um, problematic. But once you have your relief film, then the next step is to get it onto a sheet of lead, very soft lead, and inside a hydraulic press and under 300, 400 tons of pressure per square inch, you press that relief into the lead. And then you peel off your film, which, you know, hopefully doesn't shatter, and you have a lead mold. That's a topographical mold. The best way to describe a Woodbury type is take a pile of mashed potatoes on a plate, <laughs> a really dark brown gravy, take your fork and make a bunch of, you know, holes in there and different things, pour the gravy on it. And where it's deep, it's dark. And where it's high, it's light. Yeah. And that's a Woodbury type. So. But, okay, so the gelatin when you go to the lead part of this is hard and can withstand the pressure and can press into a metal that is soft enough to take it in. It has no place to go, but into the metal. Okay. And then, but then when you describe peeling the gelatin off at the end, you don't want it to shatter because you want to make another plate with it. It's good to keep your relief films, um, you know, for just in case. Future use, okay. yeah. So, because just just making that lead mold is a very pl- problematic. I mean, Barrett has to sit there and put shims on the lead, even with the most you know machined pieces of. We have, you know, two inch steel plates that have been um, machined to one one thousandth of an inch, and those are the guys that are on top of the lead in the film inside the hydraulic press. And because everything has to be perfectly equal, uh, just a little bit off and your photo will show it. So all of a sudden, a gray background will show a dark spot or something like oh. that. So it, it's very touchy. And that was another reason why, you know, people had to be artisans um, to make these things back in the 19th century. You know, once you have that lead mold, then you, you, you pour a puddle of hot gelatin that's got pigment in it. Uh, and then you put a piece of treated paper on it. I mean, just the paper alone. We don't have 19th century paper, unless you can find some around. But just the sizing and the bleaches that were used in the 19th century are totally different than, you know, new paper now. So um, preparing the paper is a big deal. And luckily, Barrett Oliver is the foremost 19th century I think, uh, photo mechanical, photo photography guy in the country. I, I, I personally think that huh. so, um, he's amazing. Again, back to those patents, uh, you know, they were completely unhelpful because they read things like this. Um, prepare your gelatin in the usual manner. <laughs> yeah. Lubricate the lead plate with salad oil. Oh, golly. What was salad oil in 1889, you know? I, I, you know, we, we think it was some kind of olive oil, but um, um, I'll, I'll let a secret out here. We found WD-40 works really well. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's the, that's the story of Woodbury Wait, wait, wait. Types. Hold on. I still have another question. <laughs> so af- you said pigmented gelatin. Uh, so w- once you get your lead plate, the image into the lead, then what happens? Then you have a mold that you can repeatedly print. Now, in the world, there's no Woodbury printing presses that exist. Rumor has it one might be somewhere in the basement bowels of the British Museum. Or or the British Science Museum. You know, know, they're just none around. There's parts of them here and there. We have plenty of illustrations of what they look like. And Barrett was able to find a, a 1912 Kodak dry mount press that had a ball joint on the top platen that really mimics what the Woodbury printing press was, not the hydraulic one to make the lead, but the printing press. And it works out really well. Um, You know, again, we have machine plates for the platen made and attached. It only needs minor pressure and it squirts out all the excess gelatin, but the gelatin then conforms to the highs and lows of the mold making the tonal range 
um, in, in pigmented gelatin. And uh, after three or four minutes, it, it cools down and it attaches itself to the substrate of the paper that's been prepared, and it peels right off. And, um, you know, when they're wet, they're amazing because they're, they're actually topographical. You can see the, you know, the highs and lows. As they dry, they shrink down. To a lot of people, they're very hard to tell the difference between that and the um, traditional carbon print. But if you have a trained eye, you can kind of, I mean, I contend you can, you can see in the shadows a little more, like there's a little more depth in a Woodbury type. That's the holy grail. Okay. Are you, photomechanical reproduction. I'm telling you, photomechanical, 19th century photo anything is always a little bit of a brain twister for me. So I'm going to. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to play really stupid here and say, okay, can you just do five sex on the carbon print? Carbon print is basically a photogravure, but instead of mounting the gelatin, pigmented gelatin, that's on a paper base, instead of transferring it onto a copper plate, with a carbon print, you transfer it onto a piece of paper, and then you wash it and develop it out the same way you would a photogravure stencil, gelatin stencil on copper, only it's on paper. Huh. Um, and the pigment is a different pigment. Usually people use... Uh, well, that's where the term carbon tissue, carbon paper came from, because they used the carbon black. But people use the sienna and this and that, um, different shades. For photogravure, we use some iron oxide, kind of a red type of um, pigment for gravure so that uh, the exposure kind of eats up some of the stray um, ultraviolet light. Oh, huh. Okay. Oh, now you're getting really <laughs> beyond my... Okay, I'm, I'm, <laughs> we're in arcane territory, so... <laughs> But but with the Woodbury type, you can pigment the gelatin that's acting like ink-ish, sort of, in any way you want. Like, you could do it. No. No. Uh Uh-oh. It's very strict. Okay. (laughs) Well, when I say pigment, it's it's almost, there are certain inks that you mix with the gelatin. And if the pigment isn't fine enough, it shows up as little, little tiny specks. Um. So, again, this is something proprietary that Barrett's found. He found just the right type of ink where the pigment is fine enough that, you know, you don't see small dots and stuff. <laughs> and you can't use dye, which would be, okay, why don't you use dye? Well, you know, because it's, it's fugitive. It'll, mm. it'll fade. The fascinating thing, that, you know, as the museum cataloger person, if I had seen dots that were pigment pieces of elements of it, I I probably would have confused that with, I mean, not like an aquatint, but like, I would yeah, wonder like if it a, was in the image versus the right. material. Right. <laughs> it, I, it, you might not have even seen them. Probably not. So yeah, probably. We're, we're, <laughs> yeah, we're talking, you know, like we're very, what's the word? Picky, I guess. Yeah. I oh, know. gosh. A too much, but wow. I, oh if God. you make everything just right, then it, everything works out at the end. Okay, so so you printed those Chuck Closes, is what you're saying? No, no. Well, you know, I was Barrett's um, assistant, so, but Barrett Oliver did all of the Woodbury type printing in two palms. So he was like a guest printer in for a specific project. He two palms. You know, we we kind of like you know we we work a little differently. People come and go. I mean, my position in two palms right now is I'm more of a consultant and working on special projects. So my, you know, my big special project right now is, is Robert Crum and, and his etchings. So that's been my thing for the last uh, couple of years. Okay, so after the Woodbury type knowledge has been infused in your brain, you've returned to etching and is, is etching your, your happy place? Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I'm an intaglio type. My own work that happened in school and high school and what got me into this always uh, revolved around etching and the fine lines one could get with it, which in 1980 landed me in Belgium with my own work because the Ministry of Culture people had a show of some printmakers from Long Island, and they kind of took on to my prints and I sold some and then they asked for more and I sold some. and then they invited me over there and I went there to make prints and 
they asked if I would teach a class of these techniques because they were saying, we'd never seen somebody do that. We don't, what are you making? What is this? So I did. And I know my wife and I spent about, oh God, a month and a half there, almost two months. And it became a thing. And it also was a kind of a gateway into teaching. So since 1980, I've been also an educator for the last 10 years. I presently teach printmaking at Columbia University. And I, before that was NYU and, you know, places like that. So I've always been, you know, educating and teaching. But that came out of my own work. So I'm always doing that. Always making prints at studios because the dynamic, I mean, it's a form of a drug for me and for other types of people of being in a studio. And this goes for the artists, too, that that this group thing happens. And especially in a studio like Two Palms, where the vibe is so, um, it's just alluring. It's a great studio, fantastic studio. They've always um, impressed me because I think, correct me if I'm wrong, they've dropped press out of their name. They're now just two palms, and they've positioned themselves as n not strictly print, so they, they don't really do print fairs except for the IFPDA. But they're in the Armory Show, and they're at Miami, right. and they're, they're bringing print forward into the sort of larger landscape of art and art fairs and contemporary art yeah. in a way that other people aren't. I mean, just the artists that choose to work with them and where they propel themselves. Um, just take Mel Bachner alone. The paper pe uh, pieces that are being made now of cast paper. You know, you, when you hear cast paper, you think of certain things we know, right? Until you see one of these. <laughs> What, is, how, how, how is the thing? And and they're fascinating, along with being beautiful and everything else. Yeah, Two Palms is, it's not your typical print studio. And I think that's one of the exciting things, both for artists and for the crew that works works there and, and flows in and out. Yeah, so when you mentioned Bel Mel Bachner, I'm thinking of the pieces with the words across the, I assume that's what you're talking about. How do they make those? <laughs> it's me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I know. Certain people gravitate to two palms. And so you have people like Sarika and uh, Christopher who are incredible mold makers, paper makers, history of background, this type of thing. Again, working out this way of like, what will interest the artists? What, what, what direction can we take this in? How far can we take this? And with an artist like Mel Bachner, you can go really far with, with a set parameter. The man's working with the English language or other languages. I know they're making these high-tech molds out of weird foam, and then the paper pulp is sprayed onto these molds, they're cast together, um, Mel is in charge of the colors of the paper. It's quite amazing, so. But it's it's a place where I'm, I'm lost, you know, because I, I know the basics of making paper, and this is like, you know, like nuclear technology to me. But I, I love the, how you're talking about how it all happens there, the, the magic sauce, which is that they are basically following the artist's lead, obviously helping them think through what's possible and all that stuff. But it's it's a different mindset than the traditional print shop, which is, you know, we offer etching and litho and maybe we'll right. layer them on top of each other. But that's about it. And right. it's just it's like, um, I don't know, it's it's such a different model. It's great. Yeah, it, it's constantly evolving, you know. I think that that's one of the, the um, important aspects of Two Palms, that it it is, it's like, why do we have to constrict ourselves to certain parameters? We, we can offer that. Elizabeth Payton or Chris Ophelia or uh, somebody wants to make a, you know, smoked hard ground etching. Yeah. And, and we still do. So that's available, you know, to the 10th degree. Right. 
but also if Matthew Barney wants to grow copper nodules through his Woodbury types that are mounted and then 24 karat gold plate them. <laughs> Yeah, we figure that out too. Well, yeah, I have the two poems side up next to the screen where we're recording. And I, yeah, what is going on with those Matthew Barneys? <laughs> well, that's Matthew. Oh my I mean, gosh. You know, nothing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the minute he walked into two poems, um, and he came in as one of Elizabeth, you know, Elizabeth Payton works with sitters. And in, in a, to me, a really 19th century uh, manner, she'll have a sitter come in. And they're usually friends or other artists. And she draws them right right there on, on a traditional etching plate. So Matthew had come in a few times to sit for Elizabeth. And he was very interested in the studio. And it's one of those things that's like, you know, hey, can we do something? And it's like, yeah, <laughs> let's do something. So, and he was very interested in the Woodbury types. But he's Matthew Barney, so... So just a Woodbury type is uh, that's that's too that's too normal. <laughs> Let's push this stuff. But that's that's how that all came about. And you know, it's and it's years of R and D and you know figuring out how we're going to laser cut through the Woodbury types and then uh, mount them to copper and then grow these nodules and uh, nickel face them and then gold plate them and what have you. So. Would you consider that to be the, one of the most complex projects you've ever worked on? Yeah, I mean, it really was. Myself and Doug Volley worked on it for a good year and a half before you really, you know, kind of got a result that was repeatable. Because, you know, everything gets thrown at you, you know. Okay, to grow that copper, you have to be a certain temperature. Well, the Woodbury type melts at that oh. temperature, you know, in the bath. You know, so it was this whole thing. And then uh, Doug Bowley's son, who is a, a, you know, a walking genius, he came into the picture and started to figure out a lot of the uh, mechanics behind how this thing would work. Conrad Bowley. That's another thing, too, with the teams and stuff. People kind of know my name, but I've, you know, for going on 50 years now, I'm part of a group of people that, you know, we all work together from Tom Cox, John Lund. Uh, you know, we're go I'm going back 45 years at Universal Limited Art Editions, all the way up to the people I work with today. At, at Two Palms. With Two Palms, the monotypes and the mono prints that Mel Bachner makes, I find it really interesting. Like they needed a few more people for the team that works with Mel. And instead of advertising for printmakers, Tom Smith, the, the head of the Mel Bachner group, advertised for people that work with color. Oh. Colorists, painters, that type of oh. thing and brought them into printmaking. And Mel has a different feeling now when he works with these printers and colorists. And they, they kind of, you know, they kind of get the vibe from him and know where to go. Right. And stuff. So, you know, there, there's another little aspect of Two Palms, which I find to be super cool. Right. I feel like, I think I talked to Phil Sanders about this. When you're part of the brain trust that is creating the magic, you know, you don't get the credit or whatever, but it is, in fact, this brain trust, and everybody is necessary on the team. Yeah. Um, and it, and I think I think people looking at that Matthew Barney on the wall at the Armory Art Fair, like, they just miss that entire thing, which I think is such an intriguing part of the whole. I don't know. I wish yeah. I wish it was clearer to people. Right. I mean, the, the last group that Matthew did with the dyed paper alone, you know, which was fabric mounted to paper that was then dyed in uh, aniline dyes to match the frame color up to different, you know, this was, you know, this was Georgia uh, Kong. This was Aurora Diamende working this stuff out for months to create an edition of it. So yeah, it's 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 always a team. I'm most comfortable working that way. So Sure. The other thing that Phil pointed out so brilliantly is like if it took you and a team of however many 
a year and a half to figure out this one thing. Like the amount of money invested ahead of any sales possibilities, you know, it's immense. And that, that when you look at a print and it's $50,000, well, there's a reason, you know, <laughs> it took that much to well, develop and the materials and all of that. Yeah. When you're a publisher in the position of two palms, you offer the artist complete creativity. And I think one of the secrets is just don't think about that, you know, and, and worry about that at some other day. And, and that's how, um, that's how, you know, some fantastic work comes, comes to us that way. Oh, I agree. Um, Yeah, no, I agree. The team should be completely out of that equation and not worrying about all that stuff. It's something that's never even mentioned. So to their credit, if you're not thinking about that, that's fine. Right. So, right. I remember um, at Robert Rauschenberg's studio down in Captiva, the first time I was down there working, the crew was, uh, I, I mentioned something to one of the guys. I was like, my God, because they had the newest and the best things. Like, And we're talking tools and things, pneumatic, you know, sanders and this and that and everything. One of the guys, Lawrence, said, uh, oh, the boss says just get the best and get the newest and don't worry about anything. So... I always kind of keep that keep that in mind. Yeah. The opposite of, uh, oh, it's not the tools. Well, they help. Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, absolutely. My my husband's father is notorious for spending an entire afternoon trying to fix something with the wrong tool. <laughs> <laughs> and then they go to Home yeah. Depot five times and finally get the right one. <laughs> it saves a lot of time. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, it's yeah. worth it for sure. <laughs> All right. So tell us what's on the wall behind you. On the wall behind me? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, it's, uh, let's see, I have to, my God, my hand's not working. <laughs> Craig's trying That's to point. That's a yeah. oil painting that my sweetheart made while we were both in high school of Bella Lugosi has Dracula. Below it is a etching by uh, Jasper Johns, made at Two Palms, for Wynn Komarski's 80th birthday, uh, David had arranged that, and that was wonderful. Did you print that? Yes, yes. I, I printed that one, I must say. The uh, actual plates were made by John Lund up at Jasper's Print Studio in uh, Sharon, Connecticut. And John and I worked together for 25 years, so it was quite simple to have that continuation. Next to it is a Robert Crumb etching. That was signed last year. It's an ongoing project we have with um, Robert Crumb, going back and forth. Um, we just sent, I think, 15 smoked ground etching plates over to his residence in the south of France. And uh, we'll take it from there. And above it is one of the first photogravures I made with um, Bob Rauschenberg in 1984. And behind my head, right there, that a- that's it. Elizabeth Payton yeah. etching of Eminem. So, oh, from, <laughs> perfect. And the guitars, but, too. So you still play. Yeah, because, you know, I, I mean, you never know, you know. I, Peter Gabriel just had a concert, and, you know, those guys are 72 and what have you. So <laughs> who knows? So, they might need you. But I, I still play. Yeah. So. Let's circle to Robert, Cr- our, excuse me, R. Crumb. Tell us about uh, the Enigma. I've always had a few artists uh, when I was young, a lot of the il- illustrative artists such as um, Frank Frazetta uh, and later in uh, the mid 70s, late 70s, uh, H.R. Giger, you know, from Alien fame. And these were people that once I was in printmaking, I was like, wow, wouldn't it be great to make prints with, with these guys? And of course there was R. Crumb. I guess what? eight, ten years ago, he started to show up in the fine art market and be recognized as, you know, an important aspect of contemporary art, in a way. Paul Morris and David Werner, they they were, you know, kind of instrumental in this. And David Lasry also always admired Robert Crumb. So we had a mutual reason to pursue him and pursue him we did ah. for months and years because, you know, don't don't take the first no. One of the things I like to do with an artist is make something um, that 
I would consider it like a, like a teaser. Like, look what we can do. So we did that a few times with Robert Trump. And at some point, Paul Morris gave us one of his drawings that he calls um, Waiting for Food, where Robert draws on, you know, the placemat <laughs> while he's waiting for his thing. And I mean, it's incredible what this man is capable of. So we, we kind of worked that and said, this could be made into a, you know, a beautiful etching if it could look like this. At that point, Robert was, um, well, that's nice. Like, I think I'd like to try that. And that started it. And we were able to uh, to start working with him. His wife, unfortunately, passed last September or October. I think one of the things to take his mind off that was to come back to the United States and kind of do a tour in a car from the East Coast to the West Coast. So when he came to New York, you know, got here, he spent some time at Two Palms. For us, it was, oh, my God, we have the man himself in the studio. And then on the way back, because it was a few months of traveling, he went with a cousin, I believe. On the way back, again, he left from New York, but we had a few additions for him to sign. So it was kind of fun. We were able to produce some stuff right in that period of time. And we hope we'll be able to do this back and forth with Robert. So, But that's now my special project. I'm kind of tied into that with Two Palms. Have you said, Evie and, and David, I need to go to the south of France and deliver some things? <laughs> we Well, we, actually, we were in Paris last September, but that's when Aileen, his wife, took ill. We were supposed to meet and do things, but it, it just it, it didn't. I think in the future, things will be headed that way, one way or another. Right. But it's so interesting that he came on a trip through New York and he was in the studio as a sort of big deal because basically you could make an addition for an artist and they never step foot in the studio is what you're saying. No, no, not in my tenure. No. So it's, it's good that Robert had set foot in the studio that we were able to work with him directly. But no, I mean, going all the way back to Bob Rauschenberg. Yeah. We would do stuff through the mail, but you know, at some point there's face to face and hands on that type of thing. So all the artists that we work with, um, they come to the studio, they work in the studio from start to finish. So, Except for, except for maybe Jasper. I'll push you on this one. <laughs> you want to talk, Jasper is the enigma. Okay. So. Oh, good. Tell us. Is the enigma. He's very serious and he knows where he's going with an, with an image. I think after years and years of experimentation and pushing, he really has his, his particular language. So he has his own print studio. But again, you know, John Lund, he's down at Two Palms then, you know, when we're working, at, I'm up at Sharon, you know, um, proofing that with John, okay. that type of thing. Right. So kind of in a studio, not <laughs> physically. But. Nice. But other than that, I mean, that was, an, that was another interesting thing to be in Soho and have artists just ringing the doorbell, passing by, which at Universal Limited Art Editions, you know, it was much more of a schedule because, you know, people had to come out to Long Island. But at Two Palms, it's, you know, oh, I'll be right over. You know, Terry Winters needs to, you know, take a look at the proof. I'll be there in five minutes, you know, <laughs> boom, 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 that type of thing. Or an artist is there and the doorbell rings and, oh, it's Peter Doig. You know, he, oh, I just stopped by to say hi, you know. So it's a really fantastic location to have. Sure. Yeah, I, I have not been to Two Palms. It's on my list. and <laughs> You have to come visit. <laughs> I would love to. Okay. There's a... There's a date. Yeah, okay. right. There you go. Yeah, no, I've always appre appreciated and, and admired the work that they produce. Is there an artist that you have worked with that you, upon first meeting, just thought, we're going to be friends, that I really get this artist and they get me, and it's just like an instant connection? Uh, a lot of them. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And we've become dear friends. I don't have enough fingers. Terry Winters, Carol Dunham. Cecily Brown, from the old guard, uh, Bob Rauschenberg, Jim Rosenquist, Jasper. 
Jasper Johns. We're friends, you know. We talk to each other in email, and we have the same interests and things. But yeah, just about all of them, you know. Chris Ophelia, Peter Doig. Really, I don't think I have ever met an artist that uh, that it didn't, you know, something didn't click. Huh. So interesting. And you work with them for a while, and you tend to develop a relationship. Oh my God, Matthew Ritchie. We haven't made prints in maybe fifteen years, but you know, we're still vitally talking and doing stuff. Mel Bachner, my God, dear friend. Oh God, there you go. There you go. So yeah, all of them. <laughs> I don't think I've met any of those artists, which might surprise people, but I'm much more um, apt to meet you guys crisscrossing through fairs and stuff or on my tours than I am. You know, I wouldn't. Okay. I would never presume to call Bob Rauschenberg and say, can I come to a studio visit? Because I mean, okay. you know, I guess unless I'm doing a specific project on that artist, it would right. just have to happen by happenstance. And it doesn't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm in a position to develop these relationships. So, oh my God, Jane Hammond, Suzanne McClellan, Susan Rothenberg, um, you know, Lee Bonacue. Oh, tell me about her. I love her work. She was, she was so, she was a gentle human, you know? I mean, she was just so, she lit up a room. But then, you know, that creative, this powerful, type of of my god where did that come from you know luckily lee had made some prints in the early 80s back at universal limited art editions and i i had the ability to kind of assist my god you know i didn't i wasn't working directly with her but you know we i drove her back to pennsylvania a few times and you know so we spent some time together talking and what have you and i just found her to be just somebody you know, that really cared about people and and the world. Susan Rothenberg, again, um, unassuming, but incredible power. And she had told me once, you know, if you're going to do something, just make sure it's, you know, go to the limits, make it powerful, you know, and damn the torpedoes. And, you know, from this, this incredibly gentle person. So. So many different kinds of people are artists, obviously, but I, I feel like I've met some over the years that have been sort of um, having fan moments with you guys, you know, like they, like they don't, they haven't gotten to that point in their career where they're like, I'm all that in a bag of chips. And they're like, oh my God, you're Craig Zamiello. <laughs> you printed with, you know, Rauschenberg or whatever. I'm so lucky to have been able to travel this road. My God, I've walked with giants. If I stop and look back, I go like, you know, I'll start trembling or something. <laughs> but, you know, it, they are people and they tend to be, well, Bob Rauschenberg was bigger than life. So right. I'll just, um, he just, he saw art in everything. There wasn't a minute, you know, you'd be in a restaurant and the uh, a waitress or a waiter would say, uh, you know, would you like some more? And, and his statement would be, who well, would want less? You know? <laughs> Give me everything life has to offer. You uh -huh. know? But I'm involved in so many different things in my own life. You know, I mean, like this amateur entomologist to boot. So for, you know, 50 years also, I've been amassing a insect collection from all over the world that has been ascended into the American Museum of Natural History. And now you can see some of it in their new Gilder Center. That's a permanent exhibition. And so it's like, there's that part of my life. There's, you know, my own artwork life where I'm published by studios like Flying Horse Editions and Neiman Center and, you know, uh, the Franz Mazarel Center in Belgium where... You know, I, I used to teach there once a year throughout the 90s. There's the education part. I also used to build docks and, you know, what? did construction work and, you know, our whole family. I mean, uh, my wife and I, you know, she's an incredible artist. Our two girls that are completely grown now are um, 
you know, they grew up in art. They grew up in print studios. My older daughter is an advanced imager and does kind of what I do, only in the digital realm at Lamont Studios. She works with photographers and creates digital printmaking with them and stuff. My younger daughter is probably one of the best artists I know, and she's a graphic designer, you know, by trade and a musician who plays in hardcore punk bands at the same time. Oh, my gosh. You know, so it's been a lot of good stuff along the road. So, it seems bountiful. There, that's a great word. <laughs> yeah. So they pay me the big bucks, great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, when I talk to people like you, it makes me think, I know this podcast is not about me, but it makes me feel like in my role as a museum person, a curator, that I was a spectator from the nosebleeds on the world that you are so entwined and involved in. And I feel like, I mean, I loved my career as a museum person, but I feel like I missed I didn't know that your world was a thing I could have jumped into back in the day, but I feel like if I had to do it over again, I might like stick my little nose in there and go. I didn't know it either. You know, <laughs> like I said, this was supposed to be part time. You know, back in the day, I was going to be a rock star. So, if you could join any band and play, who would be your like heart oh heart place God. to that's join? A, that's a, that's a hard one. <laughs> Boy, I don't know. Probably, probably Peter Gabriel. Oh wow. So. There you go. Okay. So just because he's at the front of my mind touring the world at this point in his life. So he's in his se he's isn't seventies, right? Seventy seventy three or wow. seventy four. Yeah. And his bassist is seventy seven. And it's fun for us because here's my daughter who grew up with that, you know, who went to see them last weekend. So she got to see what, you know, which I think it's just different type of generational thing that we have that maybe our parents didn't quite have or our parents from the 40s and the 30s they you know their music wasn't our music and stuff whereas i i think i think our our music is much more well i still i'm so again lucky that i get to work with young people in school and at the studio because they keep me current that's a good word. That is a good uh, word because my kids are in their twenties, and you know they they there was a period when all we were listening to was Drake, and I don't even know who. And I was like, I can't, I just, <laughs> 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 and I felt that very much the generational divide or whatever. But now you know now yeah. they've circled back around and they're listening to things that are much more close to where I sit in Americana ish. Think, you know, <laughs> I noticed that in the nineties when you know. My daughter had a Nine Inch Nails CD, and so did I. And I was like, which one's yours? And then, you know, we both go to the concert. So. Oh, that's fun. I, I'm always curious about this with the the collaborating. I know you're not a collaborator, but a collaborative printer, I'm sure, varies from artist to artist. Do you feel like you are free to chime in about content and um conceptual rigor and is there ever a place where you feel comfortable sort of saying you know maybe think about this oh yeah yeah depending on the artist but with certain artists absolutely in fact they're looking for that so ah. they're looking for that and again i'm going to go all the way back to uh to bob rauschenberg and it you know i'm a year and a half out of college and here's this icon saying what do you think of this color and I'm like, why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> but I quickly learned that he wanted to know what I thought. And that was an okay thing. It's okay to have an opinion, you know, because it's just an opinion. You're not making a, a law here or whatever, or, you know, a life and death decision. My older daughter always says, there are no art emergencies. <laughs> yes. I like that. Exactly. I love that. And, uh, Every time something like getting really critical, you know, we're like, wait a minute, there's no art emergencies. No one's going to push the button. But um, yeah, and a lot of artists ask for that, you know, and I mean, distill it down to what do you think and that type of thing. But as the years go on, you know, you, you know how to finesse things. Well, what, what if we did this? <laughs> 
or I kind of like, you know, that one, you know, that type of thing. And um, I'm sure they know what's going on, but I think they're looking for it. And that's why they want to work in a situation with people in the studio. Most of these artists are painters working solely by themselves in the studio, uh, maybe with one or two assistants. But they want that dynamic of, of people, the group think that can happen, the occasional comment of somebody walking by and going like, oh, God, that's beautiful. There's a thing that happens. I, I think all of them, you know, th that's why they work at Universal Limit Arts. That's why they work at Two Palms, to have that that group of people um, functioning in, in a way, to get away from that solitary type of thing. Sure, right. But yeah, they're looking for, they're looking for input. Right. And, yeah. and on that... And we're looking for input. Sure, of course, yeah. of course. And on the idea of, of there's no art emergencies, in my conversation with, <laughs> excuse me, Phil Sanders, he said, the nice thing about the print world is we get a do-over. We just redo it and we change this and yeah. do that. And and right. something you can't really, I mean, you can sort of in painting, but. Right. <laughs> we never lose a plate, you know. And once we've worked it, we'll turn it over and use the back. Yeah, printmaking lends itself to that. So that's a good point. Yeah. What's your least favorite technique to have to work in? Or do you not have to do that anymore because you're you? <laughs> My least favorite? Oh, I don't know. Typography? Ah, interesting. <laughs> you know, actually, oh, yeah. You know, pre-press, um, stripping and, and that type of thing. I mean, because I was doing work in the dark room, which I love, you know, actual film and copy cameras and that type of thing. But... Working with type, film type in the dark room, where you know one degree of temperature changes the type size, uh, and you're doing a book layout on film, I, I I didn't like that. It became really a problem. And when computers started to come in, you know, and boy, am I dating myself here, <laughs> but when. When we, I was like, oh my God, we can lay, I don't have to work on a light table with these, all of these, I, we can do this on a computer. And all of a sudden, I love type. So, but, you know, when we were laying out, like for Bob Rauschenberg's Rocky catalogs, Rauschenberg Overseas Cultural Exchange. So for each country he had a show in, he, he used the format of a Time magazine because he loved Time the magazine itself. He did, I don't know, nine or 10 covers for, for time. But we used that format. We had their permission. And um, that was all done by hand with our copy camera. We'd get the type back from the typesetter and we'd have to cut it all up and paste it and then photograph it and then make, you know, offset litho plates. Oh my and, God. You know, so it, it was, you know, the old days where you, you, Cut and paste. You were strippers. You were film plate makers the whole bit. So I, yeah, pre-press, I, I eh, didn't like. <laughs> the only time I ever saw, and I think I might have shaken his hand, uh, Rauschenberg was at his Rocky show at the National Gallery. Right. Which I was a member of the staff at that point there. And I, I just remember him wandering around with a big tumbler full of whiskey or something. <laughs> That's all I remember. <laughs> yeah. He, like I said, he loved life, mm -hmm. and, you know. That was part of it. At some point, he had to get away from the whiskey and get into uh, more into wine, which he started to appreciate, too. So. Sure. But, um, yeah, I was at that. The opening yeah. for the National Gallery Rocky show, that was the food from every nation. That was, oh, it was amazing. But what a show. Yeah. What an amazing show. Yeah. So uh, We could have oh. met then. Oh, well. <laughs> All right, so at, I feel like I've forgotten to ask you something critical, but I've, we also have spoken for more than an hour, if you can believe it. <laughs> mm, okay, yikes. I know. Can you believe it? Well, you made that really easy. I, I you know, God. And plus, I just, you know, I'll blabber on. So sorry about well, that. That's why I asked you, because you're a good storyteller. <laughs> and I also feel, I feel pretty strongly that there is a group of you guys who 
I mean, not that you're retiring anytime soon, but that your careers go back into this transition to computers. And like you cover a stretch of time that ought to be captured, honestly. And um, somebody ought to, you, somebody, you should write a book about <laughs> your career. Interesting idea. I mean, I did a book with Lisa Hodomarski, this curator of prints and drawings at Yale Art Gallery. Because people had said, you know, why don't you do a book? Why don't you do And I was like, do we really need another printmaking book? You know, about, you know, all right, this is how you make an awkward tent. But Lisa had such a great idea. And was like, why don't we talk about how a group of prints were made, just specific prints? Mm. And let's get the artist's idea. You know, what, what's their story on that particular print? And so she she had come up with this, um, and I was like, yeah, you know what? That's that's different. And I, good lord, when was that published? I don't know, two thousand and eight or seven or nine. I don't know. So that's out there. That one, you know. And then Phil's book came out. Mine was Conversations from the Print Studio, and we took ten artists with ten particular prints, and what I had to do, and what they had to do, and then what we both did, you know, to make this work. And then Phil came out with his book, Prince and Their Makers, which again, is it's kind of carrying this whole idea of, and I love your term, the print ecosystem. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think these are great directions to really get people interested in, you know, what, what happens in this type of situation. I think it's a special relationship that you guys have with the artists, for sure. And I think um, there's, you know, there's stuff to be learned in there. One of the things I'm trying to do with the podcast is to peel back the curtain and say, you know, we're all people who have cool jobs <laughs> and the magic is made in this way, you know. Right, um, right. And I think those books, both of those books have, have taken people inside the, you know, the magic sauce. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, don't get me wrong. We all need how-to books. But I didn't think anybody needed a how-to book for me. And I, I think Phil kind of felt that way in a way, too. It was like, let's find out what's going on in this world, this this strange um, print world of ecology. So, right. And I think it was a great book that he made. Yeah, no, I agree. So. And he, he reported to, to me in our conversation that, he decided to take it in that specific route because um, he had a conversation with Star Figura at MoMA who said what's missing for us as curators is this sort of inside the, you know, the cauldron <laughs> look. Yeah. We don't know how it's made. We don't know what the motivations were, who decided what. And that goes back to my thinking I was up in the nosebleeds that whole time I was a curator because we, ne we never are in the studio when it's, you know, we're there after maybe some people. Right. Right. But usually we just see it on the wall and that's our first introduction to it. And yeah. there's all this that happens yeah. to where it's made. And then there's, you know, the rest of us and we're trying to backpedal and reverse engineer it and figure out how it was done. And we just needed to talk to you. That's interesting. Yeah. My goodness. Well, there's another one coming out and um, I was privileged to be a reader for oh. it. Um, I Jennifer Roberts from Harvard and it's based on her Smithsonian lectures, um, contact the pull of the print. And oh my God, this really, it's, coming from every angle of the creative process of making a print. So it, this is the next step, I think. I think it's going to be released in May. Oh, nice. This year, uh, of next right. year, excuse me. So um, there's one to look for. Right, so, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, people talk about watching her videos all the time and how impactful they've been for them. She's, she starts with something and then goes full circle and ties it together. Oh, right. it's just fascinating to me. Yeah, I don't. Her brain always. I'm always like, how I don't think that way. <laughs> <laughs> like, good lord, woman. <laughs> Inadvertently, Universal Limited Edition worked with our Buckminster Fuller. Oh boy. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, you know, you think wow. back, and I didn't even think of this until you, we were just talking. But you would ask him a question, say at a lunch table, and he'd start talking and go off on this tangent. 
for 10 minutes. And by this point, you're like, I forgot what I asked. <laughs> but then, it, you know, in 11 minutes, you come back around and tie it up. And you, you go like, oh, my God, I was just educated. <laughs> Jennifer kind of reminds me of, of that type of dynamic. So. Funny. Oh, that's great. Anyway. Yeah, she's. We're supposed to record a thing, although we haven't scheduled it yet. Every time I get in touch, oh, I'll look yeah, to that. yeah, she's like, "I'm right. busy." I'm like, "All right, <laughs> I'll circle <laughs> back." <laughs> anyway, fantastic. Thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been lovely getting to know you and your um, incredible story, and I just so appreciate it. Thank you for having me and making me think about things. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Plate Mark with Craig Zamiello. Special thanks to him, of course, for being a wonderful guest. I love talking to him. And as usual, a thank you to Michael Diamond for the use of his original music. If you made it this far, you might be interested to know that Michael Diamond is actually my husband's uncle. So he's my uncle-in-law. He's a fabulous person and a wonderful musician, and he's got some new songs out over on, I think they're on Spotify. So look up Michael J. Diamond and you can listen to him actually singing. He's a beautiful voice. Also, a thank you to Dan Fury of Extension Audio. He helps me with the first pass at editing and all of the sound ins and outs, which I'm really bad at. So thank you, Dan. Okay. One last plug, if you value the content that we are bringing you with Plate Mark, please consider hitting the support and donate button over on platemarkpodcast.com and join us as a supporting subscriber. Your help would be most appreciated, and I thank you in advance. All right, we will see you next time. 